Welcome, everybody. Super happy to have you here. Um, and yeah, engage in our session. Um, we are here talking about using problem-based learning to center equity while developing educators. Um, my name is Greg Ponikbar, and um, this is David here, um, and we're excited to kind of lead you through kind of like what our journey has been with problem-based learning over the course of the last four years and the power we have seen it have, and hopefully give you some tools by the end of our session to think about how it might apply to your context. Um, so without further ado, um, welcome. I would love to, if like y'all wouldn't mind really quickly, just taking a moment to either either in the chat or just like by kind of speaking up here really quickly, just share share just like what brought you here, like what made you pick this session? Like, and that can go in any direction. Maybe you're someone who leads professional development. Maybe you're just curious about whatever, but like any kind of grounding or feedback around like why you are here would be helpful for us. Um, just because we do have some adaptability here to just make sure we're able to kind of meet the needs of the group. So whether you're putting that in the chat or you want to speak up, um, I'd love if you could just take 30 seconds to let us know. Yeah, um, I'll start uh, out loud here. Um, so I'm Ben Pendarvis. I work with Open Way Learning, and we uh, do a lot of teacher development, um, leadership development as well, and um, very um, important focus on uh, increasing equity, uh, whoever we work with. So that's what stands out to me here uh, in using experiential-based methods uh, to develop our educators looking to kind of expand our skill set there. So. Awesome. Thanks so much, Ben. That's, that's really helpful context. And Katie, thank you. So lead professional development for personalized learning in our district. Awesome. Developing educators. Great. Y'all are in the right place then. Um, exploring educators, learn and grow from experience rather than being talked at. Great. Um, from what I have seen, you are in the right place then. Um, we are definitely going to be kind of just sharing one methodology that we have used a lot. Um, and yeah, hopefully add a, add a tool to your tool belt um, and competency-based license. Okay, awesome. Um, well, great. So here's what we're going to do today um, in our session. Uh, our learning outcomes are for you to understand, and this is all at like a very basic 101 level, but like understand the theoretical and practical underpinnings of, of problem-based learning. Um, and especially in contrast to kind of maybe some of the more traditional forms of professional development that are just kind of like a default in many places. Um, so we're going to want you to kind of look at problem-based learning and see like, what is this how can this tool be used and possibly differently than the other ones that we use? Um, second, we want you to experience what it's like to engage in a problem-based learning experience. Um, problem-based learning is a constructivist approach. And so it would feel very inauthentic for us to lecture about problem-based learning, but rather we are going to have you just experience it and reflect and see what comes out of that for you. Like what, what works, what doesn't, what's powerful, what's not. Um, so that you can you can take that and kind of grow and build with it. Um, and then finally, we want you to leave equipped with some of the basic tools to start thinking about how you can apply problem-based learning in your own context. Um, the very short tagline here is like, we really, like starting small is fine. Like it doesn't have to be perfect at first, but the idea, what we have found is that like, once you kind of start get, getting rolling with this type of professional development, um, it, it is something that can kind of snowball and like what we have found at least is that people ask for more and more of it once you kind of start doing it and that allows you to refine your practice and, and kind of figure out what that looks like. Um, so we are, um, I'm going to call us grounded at this point, we're going to go into our history and background and context for just what is problem based learning and then specifically how do David and I see this in relation to equity work. Um, and then you're going to experience a very mini, mini, mini um, problem-based learning experience. Um, so you're going to need to be very ready to engage um, in a small group and kind of collaborate with your peers. Um, and you'll experience it, we'll reflect, and then we'll share next steps. That's kind of the high level of the agenda. Um, anything to add or any additional con, anything to add, David, and and or any questions from the group before we move on. I think I'm agree. 
All right. Cool. Ben, you're the only person I can see and you're kind of nodding, so I'm gonna keep going. Um, great, thank you. So um, just, just a very quick context of who we are too. Um, both David and I work with an organization called Summit Public Schools. And I work with a branch of that organization called Marshall Street. Um, and, and essentially like what our goal is, is to support schools and districts who are working on developing leader pipelines. And so in the past four years, we've worked with over 200 different school leaders everywhere from kind of like aspiring school leaders to experienced school leaders um, across 35 different schools. Um, and ultimately, like problem-based learning is like the core of the approach that we use. Um, so David and I have probably written at least 50 PBLs in the last uh, few years. Um, and it's just like a, a constant pedagogy we go back to. Um, and, and I guess that's all you need to know about us for now. Um, but as questions come up, do not hesitate to ask us. Um, so here is problem-based learning kind of in a nutshell. Um, it is a constructivist approach to learning. So it is, it is, a, it is learning centered around the concept of a moment and centered in a challenge that the people who you are leading are going to experience at some point in their careers. Generally, they've already experienced it, um, but oftentimes it's something that that like grounds the learning in a moment that warrants a response. Um, so it's learning organized around a problem, um, and participants assume the major responsibility for their own learning and determining how they're going to respond to said problem. Um, most of the learning occurs within the context of small groups, which you're going to be seeing very soon, um, and then almost every problem-based learning experience that we have um ends with a version of like a simulation that includes feedback and then like alignment from a group so we're, you're going to see like what all this looks like in practice in just one moment but just to kind of ground ourselves like this is very much kind of the the high level ideas um just as like a very quick history around um problem-based learning as used in education i think one thing that has been somewhat surprising to David and I is that um, this is not necessarily a core pedagogy you see when you go to professional development experiences um, within education. It's actually a pedagogy that began in medical schools um, and has started to become adapted to like the education sphere. Um, you probably know its cousin very well, project-based learning, um, which we use with students a lot, but um, problem-based learning is kind of another it's another lens towards that. And you'll see a few of the things that make this unique um, by, by doing it. Um, I also want to just share very quickly around how, how we see this very much overlapping with our, our work on developing school leaders as equity practitioners. Um, and it, it can take place in, in a lot of different ways. Um, but PBLs primarily are going to focus on how we do work within our current roles and in our current focus. Um, and so what I mean by that is the way that we look at grounding in equity and diversity, equity, and inclusion, at least within our, our work, is kind of through these four different levels. Like DEI includes these four different levels, the individual level, the interpersonal level, the institutional le level, and the systemic level. Um, and when we're thinking about using problem-based learning experiences while developing school leaders, we really lean primarily towards focusing on that like individual and interpersonal level um, for developing. And so what I mean by that is when you are in a school leader role, as many of you know, like equity issues arise to you not packaged in a nice way that say, hello, I'm an equity issue. Like I'd like you to attack, like I'd like you to solve me now. What the way they show up is through the casual conversations that you have, through the data that you look at, through the right, through the the climate of a school as you do a walkthrough. And a school leader's responsibility is to be very intentionally like looking for and finding those moments to kind of change the status quo, right? To respond in an intentional and different way. And that's what problem-based learning, what we see it can do in terms of like supporting equity is it's an opportunity to really slow down 
a moment that we all react to and respond to oftentimes without thinking and get really intentional about what is the issue here and how like what is how does my ideal self respond to this situation and it gives an opportunity to slow down in a way that you oftentimes don't get when you're actually in that role um and so that's part of the power we see so how does dei show up in pbls um there's always an equity challenge in them somewhere or another. Sometimes they're explicit, but oftentimes they are not. Um, and I think you're gonna see an example of that in a moment. Um, and I'll just say the whole idea of it's not always explicit, like that's the point. Um, that's what we want our the folks who we are training to think about of like always having that equity lens as they're approaching their day-to-day -day work. So I'm gonna pass it over to David to kind of start to frame up the experience that y'all are going to have. And actually, I will maybe, um, maybe I'll pause before I pass it to David and just say, I recognize I've been talking for about 10 minutes now, like questions, thoughts, feedback, reactions, something I said felt crazy to you that you want to push on. Like, let's, how are you feeling? I'm feeling good. Um... All right. Thanks, Ben. Appreciate it. All right, over to you, David. <laughs> cool, great. Uh, thanks, y'all. Um, so we're gonna move in to a very brief uh, PBL. Um, and so, as uh, Greg mentioned, we've uh, been working. Um, so I, Greg, I didn't realize how many we actually wrote. That number surprised me. Uh, we wrote quite a few PBLs in the last couple of years, uh, and so they're very complex. They're um, very. They have pre work. Uh, they also could take anything anywhere from like an hour to an all day. It's been my experience in both facilitating as well as participating in PBLs. Today's PBLs can be very brief, um, very short, just so you all can engage in some of the different ways uh, that PBLs take place in terms of um, seeing if there isn't, um, identifying that um, equity piece to it, being able to communicate with one another and find the tools that you are able to, um, to take a look at. And so that's what we're gonna be looking at today. And so, next slide please. Here is our PBL. Um, you are an assistant principal at Evergreen High School. You get an email from a teacher, a ninth grade teacher, Scarlett, who's been teaching about four years. Um, and, however, uh, Scarlett is new to your school. And so this is the email that um, you receive. And can I have a volunteer actually to read through the email, if y'all can see that? Sorry. Oh, no worries. There we go. It's in the box. Yeah. Hey, there are a bunch of kids in my class who don't want to learn, are disrespectful, and don't really know how to listen to instruction. Today, Alan even stood up in class and called me a bad teacher. This is unacceptable. Will you talk to them all and call their parents? Here's the list. It's about 10 of them. Thanks, Scarlett. Uh, thank you so much. So in about uh, 20 minutes, you're going to see Scarlett. You're going to um, talk with Scarlett. In a moment, uh, Greg is going to open up some breakout rooms. Part of the PBL experience is for groups to work through the process of the PBL, looking at the email, thinking about um, a possible response uh, when it comes to this particular uh, PBL. And so, um, and actually, oh, uh, actually, no, Greg, we're good. I think I, I got to go up a slide. So, um, when it comes to the PBL, you're gonna be placed into small groups, about three or so. In those small groups, um, you are the leadership team at the high school, and you're gonna discuss um, how to respond to Scarlett's email. And so some of the questions uh, that we provided in the uh, link that Greg places it in there is gonna looking, is looking at the immediate reactions that all of you have. Potentially, are there any problem or problems to identify? Um, the response that you're all going to give, are there any challenge or challenges that you're seeing, what the plan is, and then also weighing the cost benefits on the type of plan, the type of response you're going to be providing Scarlet. And so that's also part of the PBL experience of being able to discuss that. The other major piece, too, is the simulation. And so after the conversation, after the discussion, one of your group members um, is going to be participating in a simulation um, where you're get to present uh, what the plan is that your team came up with uh, and have a conversation with Scarlett. So we're definitely going to have Scarlett here to have a conversation with all of you. Um, and so 
Yeah, so in, I believe we're about 30 minutes for the task still. We're good? Yeah, so we're about 30 minutes to have those conversations um, with that. Uh, with the simulation, we'll also have the opportunity, part of that PBL process also is providing the feedback um, to each other, to one another. And so we'll also go through a, an opportunity to provide feedback and then potentially talk about next steps through our reflections, tools that you can immediately take with you um, beginning tomorrow. Great, I believe I covered most of it. I think we're yeah. good to go. Yeah, so really, as you, I'm gonna open your breakout rooms in a second, but just if, if this is your first time experience of PBL, like here's my tip for you is, you get much more out of it when you like really can adopt the role of like, this is my school, my teacher, and I need to make, it, like, I need to respond. So please don't talk about this theoretically. Like, oh, what this assistant principal should do is X. Like, bring yourself to it and say like, this is how I would respond. Like, this is what I think we should do. And this is a moment just to be very meta for a moment. Like, this is where, this is where the slowing down happens, right? For you to slow down, like really put on this hat and then like process with a group of peers who may have similar perspectives or may have different perspectives than you and like wrestle with this, like how you would respond here. And so the more that you can lean into um, discomfort, um, the better, um, or just like challenge each other and push, all right? Um, so with that, I am going to send you off to some groups. Uh, welcome back. So here is the moment, exciting part of our PBLs when it comes to the simulation. Everyone's so excited. Yeah. Okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, so uh, this is the moment we come together for our PBLs and um, go through, run into the simulation. And so uh, it so happens that we have Scarlett here who's gonna be, um, uh, we have a guest here, who's gonna be, gonna be our teacher here. Uh, but first, before we get into any of the simulation, I can I ask who's gonna be um, the person leading the conversation with Scarlett? Do group decide? Um, we didn't actually decide, um, but I'll, I'll, uh, I'll <laughs> give it a try. All right, thanks, Ben. Um, and so, um, Here's the setup for the simulation. About ten minutes uh, for about a ten-minute conversation, you're going to engage um, with Scarlett and have a conversation. For the rest of us, for uh, the audience, uh, what we want to do, um, and if uh, Greg can go ahead and put up the simulation feedback slide for us, just real quick. For the rest of us, we're going to be taking a look um, at the conversation, the conversation that Ben is leading, um, and seeing what are some glows grows and some questions that we're going to ask um, during our well, opportunity for feedback and also opportunity for reflection. And so here are the, the glows, grows, and questions, some of the questions, some of the sentence frame starters that we can use in terms of feedback. And that's a very important part in terms of the role of us as the audience to be able to give that feedback at the end of the conversation. And um, with that being said, uh, uh, part of it too is Ben and Scarlett, your cameras will be on. The rest of us can actually turn off our cameras so we can focus on the conversation as we are taking notes. Greg, I think I've got it covered all, right? Awesome. So we're gonna time keep uh, 10 minutes and uh, Scarlett, whenever you're ready. Ben, whenever you're ready, we can get started on a conversation. Okay. Hey, Scarlett. Hi, Ben. Thanks so much for uh, responding to my email and getting back to me about this. Um, I've only got about 10 minutes until my next class, but I would really like to address this issue. It's really getting distracting, and um, I have just about had it with these kids. Um, so uh, I've told you the situation. Um, I've just got a lot of kids in my class who don't want to learn. Um, and I'm, I'm here to teach kids who want to learn. So I, I really need to do something about these kids, whether that means removing them from the class or talking to parents. I'm Discipline is needed. And um, I, I really need you to do something about it. OK, yeah, yeah. So you need to it sounds like you need some help with these students so that you can continue doing what you're you're here to do, right? And and Absolutely. to get your job done while you're being distracted from that role. So what what would be, um, uh, can I learn a little bit more about what happened uh, in this particular experience? There's uh, about 
Yeah, absolutely. There's about 10 students in the class who just aren't paying attention. Um, they're distracting. They just don't seem to want to learn. Um, and I'd say probably the ringleader of them is Alan. Um, he just, not only is he not paying attention and not participating in class, but he distracts the other students. Um, the other day in class, he stood up in the middle of class and said that I was a bad teacher. And um, a lot of the other students laughed. Um, it was a very awkward situation, both for me and the students who are actually there to learn. Um, and I don't really see any other solution but getting him out of the class. Um, so, I mean, I'm, I'm you know, fairly new here at Evergreen, but um, right. I, I take my teaching job really seriously. I mean, I, I love English Lit and I love teaching it to these kids and I have kids in the class who really wanna learn. And it yeah. just feels like uh, these other kids are a distraction. Mm -hmm. And how how are you um, feeling with your team there on your hall? Um, are you have you been able to talk with others about these students? Is there some common experiences that uh, others are having, or how are you feeling about talking to your colleagues about it? Have you have you tried that? I mean, unfortunately, I've only been here for about four weeks, so I haven't really had a chance to get to know everybody. Um, I'm still not really familiar with how things are okay. done at Evergreen, which is why I'm reaching out to you to, to figure out what we can do about this. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, here at Evergreen, we would love to have, um, be able to support each other as, well, as much as we can, and I will do uh, whatever I can do to help you, you know, be able to focus on the work that you need to do. Um, I'm curious also what your um, particular, what, what your hopeful outcomes would be. So if I, was a, if I were to uh, start calling the parents, what, what would you like to see uh, come out of that process for Alan and, and, and Andrea and, and Jorge? You know, what would you like to see uh, in terms of their behavior or success? Um, I really, their success. Um, they just don't seem to be interested in succeeding. Um, that seems to be the main problem. I mean, I, ideally, I would love for them to, you know, face forward, pay attention, uh, do their homework, and all mm -hmm. those things. They just don't seem to want to do that. And I don't know how to get them to do that. Um, okay. I feel like that's the administration's job for discipline and, and contacting parents. Um, mm -hmm. In other high schools I've worked with, you know, I'm able to send them out of the room to the principal's office and, and you know, deal with it there, but things don't seem to work like that here. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, we want to, we want to keep these students in the classroom as much as we can. I wonder what, what you've, um, were able to attempt. And so when you say that you're, they're not working with you, what kind of strategies have you used to, to try to rein this in? And, and what do you know about these students in particular? Um, again, I don't know very much about the students. Um, okay. I've only been here for four weeks. I do know that those students are disruptive. That's the, the main thing I'm, I'm experience with, uh, experiencing with them right now. Um, I mean, Alan seems to be the most disrespectful as well as um, disruptive. The problem with that is when you have one student who's disrespectful it tends to spread to other kids who aren't paying attention and aren't engaged mm -hmm. um so i mean i don't know if there's anything i can do with these students anymore um okay i'm i, I mean i just i really i feel like this shouldn't be my problem that this should be your problem to to yeah. deal with these students and so I can do my job and teach the right. students who are actually engaged. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I wonder um, if we could if we could have a longer term goal here. We want you to be happy here uh, and to stay with us uh, and to be able to succeed, um, and of course to have your students succeed. And so uh, I wonder if a long term goal for us would be to um, get some more training and more support, uh, some collaborative support, maybe with your team. Um, and others on um, uh, management strategies, on discipline strategies that we could try um, in the classroom um, before we get to this point. And so what I, what I would love to do is to learn more about 
um, is to follow up with these students and to follow up with your team and see if there are uh, some common experiences going on. I don't, um, at this point, I'm not going to give the parents a call right away. I do need to do a little bit more research and find out more. I, I understand, I know these students a little bit, and so I kind of have an idea that there's probably different things going on that might be getting in their way as well. Um, and I want to find out why they would be uh, talking to any of our teachers in the way they have. So in the particular instance that Alan stood up and, and called you a bad teacher, was is that the words that he used? He said, you're yes. a bad teacher? Yeah. Okay. And was that in, in direct response to something or was that uh, prompted in any way or, or how I was that... trying to get him to be quiet and pay attention. Okay. And it had been about the third time I had asked him that during the day. And then <laughs> he just decided to stand up and announce to the classroom that I was a bad teacher. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. then he just sat down and started not paying attention again. It just, um, I mean, I'm all for for long term goals and 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 I would love to hear what some of the other teachers experiences have been. But in the short term, what am I supposed to do to get uh, control of the classroom back? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I, I will have to um, to talk to these students. And what what I think we can try is I think we can talk to these students together because um, one of the tools that we use um, here is, is, is empathy interviews. We want to empathize with our students as much as possible. And the same thing that I'm doing here is I'm trying to empathize with your experience because we want you to be able to, to feel the, be in the, have the conditions that you need to be successful as well. Um, so it, how does that sound? We follow up together with the students and start to find out more about the situation. Do you? My, my concern with that is that um, it feel it, that it will perceive like I needed to have administration help me in the classroom. Like I couldn't right. handle it myself. Um, right. And I feel like that may make things worse, mm -hmm. um, which is why I feel like just administration handling it, it would maybe be more advantageous. Um, I, I, I honestly mm -hmm. kind of at mm -hmm. a loss, um, but I, right. Um, so okay. what, what do you, what do you suggest in the short term? I think we need to, I think we really need to talk to Alan, um, in particular, and okay. if maybe we can get, uh, understand a little bit more about what's going on and find a way to get him engaged or maybe even give him a little more responsibility, um, for the maybe some leadership roles, uh, something that can challenge him, um, but that we can also um, get to know his experience a little bit better. I want so, <clears throat> and I think it, we do need to do this together because we need to we need to practice this. This is a skill that we need to to all work on, and we need to uh, at the at, here at Evergreen we really want to encourage these this student to teacher dialogue. Uh, to be impactful and and respectful, and so I think we if we can get together and learn uh, where you're coming from because you are new to this school and we want to establish that you are an important part of it and we want you here um, and we want to um, empathize with your experience in terms of you know how you're feeling. I'm sure this is a, a tough transition, um, and then and then find out more. <laughs> yeah, I can um, imagine. Well, listen, I have to run right now, um, but could we set up a time on calendars coming up where we can discuss this further? Yes, definitely. I'll, um, I'll speak with, the, with Alan and other students and some of the other teachers and see if we can get a plan together and I'll invite you to a, um, an, another meeting. I really appreciate your time, Ben. Thank you. Thank you. Well done. All right, everyone, thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Ben. Let's give it up for Ben, everyone. <laughs> Yeah, if y'all can come back on camera if it's possible. Thank you so much, Ben. Oh my gosh. Ben. <laughs> you're you're ben. very good, Scarlett. You're very good. <laughs> Thank you for being here, Scarlett. Thanks, Scarlett. <laughs> <laughs> See you later. Um, Ben, how did that feel? Uh it's 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 uh it, it feels uh, I feel I feel I feel like it feels like a lot of teaching, right? Like it's very uh tense it's very um everything's important 
um, and you don't want to shut anybody down. Uh, you don't want to to make anybody feel like they don't belong. Um, and it felt real, you know, it felt real. So that's, I think, the biggest, biggest thing. Um, in terms of just having the conversation with Scarlett, um, um, I know uh, the behind the scenes I was giving uh, Ben just cues and timing and all that stuff. Um, I was curious, did you by any chance pivot change the direction from when you started to seeing the timers like wind down? I was just curious about that. I feel like I saw a change. I just want to like ask that question around that. Yeah. Um, I mean, I wanted to have some kind of closure for her in that 10 minutes. Um, but I also didn't want it to be too open-ended where she felt like it wasn't like I was um, compromising her situation. Um, so not, I don't know, a, a little bit. I mean, and I feel like um, her urgency helped me <laughs> make sure that I was landing on something. I was trying to learn as much as I could in the little minimum amount of time that I had. So um, yeah, at some point I just had to say, okay, there's, uh, we need to pivot to, to what we can do. Great, thanks Ben. Thank you so much for presenting the simulation. We're gonna open up uh, to the group. Um, let's start with glows. Glows, what are something that you love, something that seemed like a good move? Uh, we can come off mute um, to, to name that for us. Um, oh, and then Ben, do you mind if we provide feedback in this? For uh, okay. the country? Okay, perfect. Um, so we can come off mute. We can also place it into the chat. So let's start with glows, something that you love and something that seemed like a good move. I have one. I love that you were very cool and calming. And I think that's an art and doing that well can calm the per another person in an experience. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, there were so many glows, um, but I think you started the conversation really well, Ben, of just like affirming, uh, affirming Scarlett and needs and then asking clarifying questions. Um, that was like really helpful, I think, throughout the rest of the conversation, because I think you actually like uncovered some like nuggets um, by asking those clarifying questions. The fact that she was new, she didn't have relationship. When you asked her, what do you know about the students? She was like, I don't really know anything. So like, it's all, it was all good to inform future conversations. Um, and then the last thing that I, uh, well, I had a lot of stuff, but one of the things I came towards the end was just you um, staying firm in like your approach of like, well, I really do think we need to bring the converse, uh, conversation to the students and like focus on that relationship building. But like you said, and not shutting her down. So I think you just did an excellent job of, of lifting her up, but being firm. And I don't know if anybody's seen the chat, but uh, Marion said, or yeah, sorry, Jennifer said, uh, you led with empathy. Oh yeah, good. Um, yeah, and something that you did early on was you asked about, like, have you talked to other people in the building about this? Have you talked to colleagues? And that really opened her up to, I'm not connected. I've only been here for, like, she was able to start to share her own vulnerabilities and her own, you know, isolation. Mm -hmm. There was a moment in the conversation that I thought was super powerful where you you were very meta about what you're doing. You're saying, I'm treating you the way that I want you to treat our students, kind of like, and I thought that was like, that was such a great moment to just show like, like we're trying to align here. And I'm like, like, yes, we're having a conversation, but I'm also teaching you as we're having the conversation. Um, and I thought that was really really powerful. And I also just want to double underline that you, you had a clear perspective and you were, and you communicated it clearly, like, no, I am not going to call the parents for you. Yes, we are going to do this together. And I think like this simulation goes wrong when people like leave it kind of with like, so are you going to call them or what? Like, and you were very, you were very clear at the end with her. And it felt like, she she like even though she didn't love it at first she was like she got on board um and i thought that was great and we're glows coming off mute spinning into the chat what about grows grows what are people thinking in terms of 
um, tried something different, considered something different, um, any wanderings uh, that folks have uh, coming off mute once again or just putting it into the chat. So, so any grows, we can continue with grows, but let's start focusing on grows a little bit. I kick us off. Um, it's really tough in a 10 minute conversation, right? And this is probably where we all would go in the next conversation, but there were some pretty troubling mindsets expressed by Scarlett around her students, around her role as a teacher. Um, I'm here to teach kids who want to learn, discipline is needed, um, administration's job to discipline. And so there was a few times where by not directly challenging that or by not directly phrasing something like, well, that's not our approach, um, you're silently agreeing to it, or it could be perceived as silent agreement. So I think we all would have gone to a place of like, yeah, that's beyond the 10 minute hallway conversation. Um, but yeah, like there was, there's just maybe looking for opportunities of like, well, I believe all your students are here to learn. So let's next, 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 you know, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I would say, John, along with that, it does help when you have some grounding documents or yeah. cultural yeah. visioning type things to ground that in because you can bring it back to what are our beliefs as adults in this system. Um, and it always helps. And it's, especially if they're shared, if, if people know them and they're shared and it drives professional learning, then it, it makes a big difference. Ben, you are not privy to any of that. So I'm just. <laughs> I want to name we've got something in the chat. Mm. Two things in the chat. Yeah. Yeah, I think like the question, like one of the questions that kind of that feedback brings up for me and one of the things that I'm, I'm always left lingering on when I see a version of dissimulation is kind of like how much in a school, like how much in that moment is an opportunity to really empathize and try to deeply understand and like just like really like be there emotionally kind of for this teacher versus like in like to probe and like push on some of the deficit mindsets and behaviors that she is demonstrating and like how do you balance that because I think that is like the art of school leadership is kind of constantly balancing those two um and so the very concrete and this is not feedback that I think you should have done this but I think like something that's interesting to consider is I think you asked a lot of clarifying questions that led to like let me understand this situation and when she was clearly not uh when she would you weren't asking probing questions I don't think in a way where it was like I think the moment that I'm thinking about is like um oh like do you have relationships with your students and she's like no and then she went on I think like that's a moment where you could say like do you think that's important to this like do you think that's connected to this problem and like push that thinking in that moment because I, I could see you know that but like you could see her just move right past it. And so like thinking about like how do probing questions like add to that, not in a way that's like harsh feedback, but just like, hey, have you thought about like you're you're not aligned here? Um, so it's a thought. Yeah. yeah, very cool. So we've got glows, grows. Um, any questions that we have lingering from the uh, conversation? Let's open it up there too. Yeah, just um, so for me, a lot of the time it's like, how do I get this teacher? Like, we got 10 minutes and then she's got to go teach again. Right. And so just taking that time to pause and like, should this person be walking into a classroom full of students in the state that she's in with the mindsets that she just expressed? Or do we need to find a bit of a timeout, a bit of like a, is she ready to get back in? Right. And I know limited resources is not always the option, but. Yeah, maybe just asking the teacher, like, are you ready to get back in front of 30 plus students right now and engage with them? Yeah. You know, I'm also wondering about this situation in current COVID times, where we already know there's 
always a teacher shortage, always a shortage of hands. Um, you know, maybe the assistant principal in this scenario is new too, right? Um, and was a teacher yesterday. I mean, who knows? So it's it's just really interesting in the idea of leading with empathy because you never really know someone else's story. You don't know the stories of the kids and the families in the room. You don't know Scarlett's story. Mm -hmm. You don't know the AP story. You don't know, you know, what's going on on that team. I mean, there's there's just so much that we may never know. All right. Well, thanks, everyone. I know Ben, you turned off your camera, but doesn't I? Have you say any last final words in terms of the simulation, in terms of the close pros and questions? Do you have anything to say? Yeah, I had to change room. No worries. Yeah, great points. Um, I was certainly, I, th I think um, I'm on the same page with everybody here that, you know, that it was troubling. <laughs> the things that she was saying, and if I was a leader in that, situation other than how can I keep her going uh, and not freaking out on everybody um, or even on herself in some ways like really like imploding um, but yeah it was that balance of like how I don't have time to push so I want to make sure there's a little bit to go on but man we're gonna have to have some some very direct conversations um, at some point or, or maybe, uh, yeah, I don't think it would go too long um, if it was, if it continued in that way. So, but I love your uh, points about the probing questions as a way to, um, um, to, to, to challenge with, with empathy. Um, so yeah, that was interesting. Well, thank you everyone for your, um, for your feedback, for your reflections. Uh, thank you, Ben, for participating in our simulation. Uh, Greg, yeah, let's give it up for Ben. <laughs> awesome. Um, yeah, truly, it it's so nerve wracking to do that. So thank you, Ben, for just like jumping in with a group of strangers and modeling that for us. Um, and yeah, so, okay. So all of that was just for you to get a sense of like, what is it like to kind of experience a PBL? Clearly that was a very fast one and a very short one. We didn't give you pre-work. We didn't give you any framing. So like, we just kind of threw you in there. And hopefully um, you can kind of, well, actually, I, I don't want to put any words in your mouth. So I just want to, I'm going to put the reflection questions in, um, in our Zoom chat here. They're also in the PowerPoint, but I'd rather see faces here. Um, and I would love to just like zoom back, like, and just like you looking at yourself as a learner in the last 35 minutes, um, what happened for you? Like, what was that experience like? Um, what did you learn? It might have been something about like a concrete, like, you know, content thing, or it might have just been like something you learned about yourself. Um, and then how did you learn? And if applicable, like how does that compare to your normal experience of professional development? So you can take any of those, but this is really just like the giant step back of like, what was that like for you? I think for me, and this is where I am, I think in my own learning journey, but um, just how much those personal belief systems play into the work that we do and the values that we have. And sometimes I think we think we have a belief or a value that it actually is not centered in how we operate. And the more we can have those conversations adult to adult and educator to educator, I think the more it can unpack some of the, oh, why do we do things that way? Um, and that's really hard. That's really deep work, but changing mindsets and um, centering on belief systems is 
yeah, it's good stuff. Thanks for kicking us off, Abby. I think something that keeps coming up for me is uh, Scarlett when she was like, this is like, this is admin's role. Like you need to handle this so that I can just get back to teaching, like just do it for me kind of thing. Um, and so that was like, that stuck with me because I think sometimes not even just within the education field, but like um, across, like whether you have a leadership role or something like you can feel this pressure that you have to have all the answers, but then like taking a step back and even looking at our prep work before Ben like engaged in the scenario, um, like us coming together to brainstorm what that conversation would look like and like think through tips was like really illuminating in terms of how when you have more heads coming together to brainstorm solutions, like it's so much more effective in terms of like moving forward or implementing change or just like engaging in different strategies. And so just it was a good reminder in that of like, we, we don't have, like, I don't have to have all the answers. You don't have to have all the answers, but we can really do this together. And then Ben, you like reiterated that of like, let's work together. Um, and I think that's so key to, to our work and just being able to address some of the issues we're facing within education. I can piggyback on that. I think it reminded me of times where my own students would talk to me about their issues with another teacher. So I taught elementary and, um, you know, they, like the whole school would have you know, one art teacher, one PE teacher, one music teacher. Um, and inevitably, you know, they would have a problem with, with someone. And sometimes that, um, it ended up where I had a, a chat with the teacher. Um, you know, I worked through it with my students. You know, they made an action plan, you know, kind of their list of demands kind of thing, different strategies they would try. Um, and when that didn't work, I would step in. Sometimes it was, it was met with welcome and sometimes not. But um, I agree with Sophia that, you know, it's, it's, it's a village approach, right? It has to be. Thanks, Marion. Yeah, I'll, I'll add to that. Like, like Marion brought up, she's had these conversations before, right? And just watching Ben do it, it it's always just shocking to me that we put, in education, we put people in situations that they've never dealt with before and don't know if they can handle it and just isolate them. Right. So like, you're not going to put an athlete into a game unless they've gotten training and practice and evaluation. But with teachers, we just say like, there's going to be a million situations that you haven't practiced for at all. We haven't trained you for, we've rooted you in theory, but haven't actually put you in these situations, go into this room by yourself and work with young people. Um, so I think like this kind of training is, it, it's critical. Like you have to be able to do the hands-on practice, feel the emotions, feel the sweat when Scarlet's giving you a hard time before you actually have to deal with a Scarlet. Yeah, yeah, I totally agree. I um, what this aligns really well with the kind of work that I, that I typically do. We use the design process, the human-centered design process to help solve teachers and, and leaders solve their own problems. And so, and I think they find that very refreshing that we, when we come in, we say, all right, well, let's look at the data. Let's get some empathy with what, with our students here. And then let's define the problem and let's come up with some solutions and then prioritize and let's be okay with uh, uh, what we call the minimum viable prototype, you know, the MVP, like what's the very you know what's something that will is not completely thought out and fleshed out and, and and complex as it needs to be but something that we can do going forward so uh you know with sophia it was like well i mean with uh sorry scarlet um let's let's have this next meeting with the three of us you know with the 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 ringleader and <laughs> um and and you and me and and practice this a little bit um and is that going to solve it i don't think so it'll be a step in the right direction it's something that we can all sink our th teeth into and and, and something's happening and 
it's addressing the the problems and the empathy that that we gathered um and yeah 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 yeah. i think it's a very good i think simulations are just a really great way um like john was kind of alluding to that like yeah we need to we need to practice this stuff we need to do this a lot together we need to and then when we come up with the solution then there's always the testing phase you know you go back and you find out like what feedback do you get from your students like how did that experience go talking to the student uh with me in the room um what are you hearing from that and so and then just continuing to have and and then maybe next time we bring in one of your colleagues how have you dealt with it? and maybe you know sometime in between here we just go out and get some coffee after work the you and your team and i'll come with you and we'll hang out and we'll hear what it's like for all of your teachers um yeah cutting down that isolation and just getting in the practice of being together um i think you're all right awesome. thank you all for the reflections um I I would be remiss if I didn't directly, since I'm reflecting on the name of our session as using problem-based learning to center equity while developing educators, just because it didn't directly come up yet, I feel like I'm curious if anyone sees the connection between this simulation that you did and equity work in schools. And if so, if you could narrate that for us. Well, I think the, the we have different levels uh, here to deal with. Wait, we got the student level, so there's there's a lack of equity in that classroom. Um, students feel like they don't have, uh, they're not being successful, um, or that they don't to play by her rules or whatever. That it's not they're not getting to the outcomes that we need um, or that we would like. Um, and then for her as well, for the teachers, that there's a, a level of equity, like, do you have what you need uh, to reach your level of success? And is that in line with, with um, the values of this organization? Um, so that's how I, how I saw it. Thanks, Ben. Yeah, I think for me, equity is really about not um, implementing a one size fits all approach, right? Like not just saying, um, equal equality or equal access, but instead really elevating the individualized needs that what students have, that teachers have, right, that um, administrators have. And so kind of talking about like this approach to personalized learning, um, whether that's like on the teacher side or the educator side to support the individual needs, but then a part of equity is also like elevating that relationship. And so I think like this um exercise really highlighted that of like how relationships are just key to like being able to meet individual needs because you're taking the time to learn first what those needs are um and then co-create solutions to to be able to offer and meet those needs so cool thank you all I like what Sophia said and I think that is why it's so important too to think at the systems level for a lot of these things is because it's really hard for an individual teacher to create a learning environment that's equitable in isolation without the system support to do that. And, you know, I think we heard a lot of um, what the teacher was talking about is, or I, maybe I'm inferring a lot of whole class type instruction to Sophia's point, one size fits all. And so if we believe that students learn at different times, different ways, different paces, and we're teaching a whole group as the majority of the instruction. And so what, a, what professional learning, what are the system supports to break from that model a little bit so that each child is getting what they need? Yeah. Yep. All of those, and I will add to like, this is one of the kind of instructions that Heather, sorry, her real name is Heather, Scarlett has is, is, um, is to just like drill down on the deficit language, like I just keep throwing it at you. Um, because I think the other equity piece in this is also, I mean, when you look at the list of, um, of students who this teacher wants to call, seven out of eight of them are students of color. 
And we oftentimes know that when those beliefs are around, just like, oh, certain students are not interested in learning or not in like that, like attacking, maybe attacking is not the right word, but like addressing that belief and like what is underlying the behaviors and the language that we're hearing, I think is the other component of the work here. Um, and I think like what you all saw was like a very incomplete version of a PBL, because just to also like zoom out a little bit more now, like the way that this might happen in like a more structured session with longer time. And one of the ways we use this PBL is do some pre-reading around either like Lisa Delpit pre-reading around like what it means to be a warm demander in a classroom um, or like readings around like communicating around values or challenging directly or whatever. And so you can, you can see how you can customize this by saying like, what is the pre-reading and the skill that we really kind of want to work on in practice? And now let's like apply that to Scarlett here. Um, and so I think like you can, the nice thing about PBLs is that you can, like as you all uncovered, as we were just listening to you talk, like there are so many different ways you could take this PBL, right? Is this about, is this about supporting the teacher in this moment or supporting the students? Is this about a short-term solution and like a band-aid, or is this about like a longer-term mindset belief thing? Is this about like, like you could take this in so many different directions. And so as like a planner, what you can do is find that moment. And then what is like the grounding support or text that you want to use to help help kind of like prime people to be looking at this situation in a particular way as well. Um, or any, or it could be around like student relationships in a classroom, right? Like, I think that was like a big theme that came up. So um, just like a few other things on that, um, on, on just like PBLs, like as a whole then, as we're stepping out of this um, is, like you can also hopefully imagine like if you're doing professional development with a team of people who are all working in the same network or like really trying to like align or norm, you know, another version of this is having multiple groups and then seeing like three different styles and then like being able to compare contrast and then like really work to align of like, who are we as we respond to this particular problem and how do we want to kind of norm there. Um, and there's no better way I know how to do that than to just like literally see it play out, um, like see different versions play out, discuss the pros and cons, and then say like, here's the version that we like we are really most resonating with. Um, and then I think the the final point I'll just make is that um, I absolutely like I think my interest in PBL like really started when I was a principal and actually like literally doing them with teachers for those moments where they like need to figure out how to respond intentionally rather than like react to students. And so like, I think that I do this with school leaders most of the time, but we've also seen it applied like very well to like teacher challenges as well. So um, anyhow, all that to say, um, let me project our, let's see, I'm looking at our time, project our final slides here. Um, And I'll also say, I mean, I think the other beautiful part about PBLs is that oftentimes the things you learn about are kind of like yourself, right? Like your own response to an uncomfortable conversation and how you get through it or your own, like your the things that kind of like trigger you. And like, so being able to kind of start to be self-aware in a very safe place around those things, I think we've also seen is really helpful. So, okay. So... This is a very basic, uh, just like, actually, sorry, let me, um, let me post in here, um, in our chat, the, if, if you are somebody who is interested, ah, I'm sorry, these are in the notes in our PowerPoint document, if you'd like to look at them, um, but when you're planning PBLs, like, here is really the way that I would encourage you to think about them is like really start your planning from like from a moment that that comes up regularly within your context and then start to identify the skills that go on top of that and like what the moment that people can act out and like really work to align on is all about 
And then make sure that I think like as much as possible, the more diverse your groups can be um, in terms of like every metric possible, the better. Um, because what you want in those small groups is people who are gonna push each other, bring different perspectives and experiences, because that's really where the bulk of the learning happens is in the conversation before the simulation. Um, and so that feels like an important piece. And then just like application is all about the simulating feedback and then kind of the reflection. Um, and so I think like, I would just like really encourage you to think, think small as you're starting. If you are excited to start doing uh, some PBL work, like I really encourage you to think about like, what are just like the, the chronic repeating problems that happen that are opportunities that need disrupted and need a reset. Like that's oftentimes a good time for a PBL, something tied with like an education theory or management theory that you're working on. Um, or like forcing people to practice a skill that they really want to avoid. I think like the most common one, especially with new leaders, is just like put people in a position where they have to have a hard conversation. And you can go, um, you can build a lot of PBLs around that and do that for like a year until people really get comfortable with that and like learn about who they are in those situations. Um, so anyhow, I hope I hope that this has been. Sorry, I'm gonna stop projecting. Like enough of like a grounding for you to give give you a sense of like how you might be able to use this and um i will i think we've got some time for questions and just like discussion for about five minutes if y'all have them um and we can go deeper anywhere or whatever you like to do so i'll just stop talking now thoughts reflections questions I had uh, put into the chat there. This this reminds me a lot of the the dilemma protocol, where you bring a a group of people together around one issue, and the teacher or whoever's there uh, in in the hot seat, you know, identifies what is it that is going on with me in my world that needs uh, I need some attention. I need more more feedback on. I can't do this alone, and that. You know, I could see that becoming the protocol that we use with Sophia and um, I mean, <laughs> Sophia, I keep using your name, Scarlett uh, and the students, maybe the Scarlett and her other teachers. We just run a I could just run a I as if as the ever uh, evergreen assistant principal uh, could run a <laughs> dilemma protocol with her and her colleagues where they're able to give uh, feedback to her and she starts to get in out of that isolation mode a little bit. Uh, I'll just like, yes, and that like our kind of one area we're experimenting a lot now too is like, as we're building PBLs um, is, is kind of starting exactly where you're saying around like a dilemma happening at a particular school site, like really learning about that and then kind of PBLifying it. Um, and the benefit that we see to PBLs over consultancies or dilemma protocols in that way um, and not the one is better, but like the benefit that we see is oftentimes that in consultancy protocols and dilemma protocols, you can get lost in like, well, the thing you don't understand about my school site is X, Y, Z, or like the content. And like, you can get really deep into like the details. And the thing that you can do when you PBLify something is like, bring it up to the principal's level around just like, this is a generic situation. We're all on the same page. We all have the same information. Um, and so that is sometimes like a nice differentiator between the two. I think both have their place and time. Um, but, but yes, like, I think that that is the way that I think that's like a really good way of thinking about how to develop these two. I had a question for you who are making the, the PBLs. Um, a lot of times we talk about equity, like the equity training happens over here and then the instruction happens over here. So I'm thinking about do you have PBLs that are dealing directly with equity issues through instruction, through school culture, but through other problems to be solved? Yes, <laughs> I can speak on those since I've created quite a few. Uh, we do. Um, and um, as Greg was mentioning, a lot of the PBLs, uh, the ones that I've written and developed over the last uh, few years are based in truth, obviously with confidentiality, keeping in mind all that good stuff, um, are based in truth. And um, I will be honest, it's potentially some of the ones where um, I've maybe made a, made a misstep and didn't find out until later, right? And so those are always some of, I feel like those are some of my best ones where like, 
amazing job of uh, getting a different perspective where we can combine both instruction equity, put it into one place and see what comes about this because we're gonna see the situation again come up next tomorrow and a week and a month. And so uh, PBS has definitely had that opportunity, uh, given us that opportunity to take a look at both of those worlds, bring them together and, and get some next steps going uh, with our school sets. So that's been really great to see, especially when it comes to um, our teachers and being able for them to experience that. Uh, the one thing I will say too, uh, with PBOs, and I, I'm going to speak from the admin, admin perspective, that uh, I am fortunate enough that my um, co-lead here at uh, here at my school site, we've gone through the PBL experience a number of years, and so anytime we have an interaction, the whole like coming together and thinking through this, it's like, oh, well, we say our language is this is a PBL, great. Now we're going to like go through it, and we really think through the process of how to respond to whatever situation we're encountering with either a teacher, a student family or another colleague. So that's been really cool to see too. Marion just asked a great question in the chat. Isn't equity always embedded whether stated or not? Yes. Yeah. I think, and that that's very much like the point. And so like taking, I think just to, taking the example that y'all did today, like that problem, if you work in a school, like you have experienced some version of, of that. Like, some version of it. it might not be exactly scarlet, but something like that. And often, and like we would argue, like that is an equity, like that is actually like a core, like one of the people who's leading a hundred students at your school has like these mindsets, like every single day was going to impact their behavior. Like that is an equity issue, but it's not packaged to you in like a, hey, here's an equity issue. It's packaged to you in a way that you would receive it, which is, hey, will you call these parents and fix these kids for me? Um, like, and that's kind of the way that they show up. And so I think that the, the, the final takeaway is really like, we want our school leaders to be thinking about what is the equity issue and kind of like everything that they are looking at. Um, and so they're as much as possible, always embedded and not, not hitting you over the head with it. So we don't see, so in short, we don't see them as separate. Like if there's not equity work here and then like instructional work here, like it's all one. Um, because that's the way the world presents itself to us. That's at least our take. Thank you so much for being here. Sorry, I recognize we're at time. So please fill out our survey. And then truly uh, our PowerPoint or our email is there at the end. If you decide to write PBLs and you want some help, like that's all I think about. So I'm, I would be super excited to work with you on it. And just like, yeah, rooting for you all. Thanks for being here and spending 90 minutes with us. <laughs>